we're starting with a quick perspective wall of three rows of four windows each. And the important thing at this stage is, is to allow for simple foreshortening. So as buildings move away from us at an angle, width is compressed. So windows appear to become narrower as do the gaps between them, as do all architectural elements that are on that wall. So here we have uh, three rows of four windows each and we can see the foreshortening taken place. And we'll put the eye level in just so that's clear. Our next task is to add some depth to our windows. So we need to consider the four edges of the window. Now on the left hand side we don't see that edge at all. When we look at the top ledge what we notice if we pay attention is that while we don't see much of that top ledge on the ground floor windows we see more of it on the second floor and even more on the third floor. As we look up we see more and more of that top ledge. It appears to be wider and wider as you go up the rows. But with that right hand ledge we see a lot of it because we're seeing it much more side on and we see the same width down the three rows of windows. So it's just seeing that pattern that we have the same width down on that right hand side but we see increasingly more on the top sill as we look up. But as we move along the rows that right hand side ledge that we see becomes thinner because of foreshortening. To explain this point, I'm going to use a ruler, which as you know, I don't normally do because it's really important that this is very accurate to make the point as clear as I can. There we are, we're the viewer. And here we have the wall that moves away from us. And we'll just stick the... Uh, just so it looks a bit more obvious what we're doing. And now we'll put the thickness of the wall in. And I'm going to make it a reasonably thick wall because again, that will illustrate the point more readily. So now I'll quickly place three equally spaced windows, equal size windows along our wall here and just pop them into place. So these parts here are the wall thicknesses these are the sections between the windows and then these are the windows, right? So we're thinking back, we're thinking back to our, our wall that we're looking at. And so when we're looking from this position, we can see here that there's this section of wall that we can't see. It's actually obscured by the angle. And so what we see is this section here. Now the important point to notice is that when I look at the next window, it's actually not the same. In fact, with this window, there's this much here that I can't see. In fact, I can see a lot less of this window pane. And when it comes to this third window, and by now, I'm sure there's no surprises. In fact, what happens is we can't see any of that window pane. All of this is hidden because of the angle. And all we can actually see is this edge of the window here. So it's quite a remarkable shift of what becomes visible to us from the one location. If as a viewer, we don't move how much of the window we see. And this is not foreshortening. This is that the actual amount of the window visible to us because of the change of position of each window from where we are as a viewer, how that shifts. It's not foreshortening, it's a different issue on top of foreshortening. And it's one that really requires careful observation if we're drawing from life. So looking at diagrams is one thing, but how does this look in real life? Well, here's a row of windows from a building in Edinburgh in Scotland. And I want you to see the pattern here. We have a double window followed by a single window, double window by a single window, single window by a double window, and then we have more double and single windows in the, 
in the final section of the building. Now these windows are all identical. The double windows are all the same and the single windows are all the same. And I just want to concentrate on the double windows because we can take them as a pair and that gives us stronger figures to uh, or larger figures to look at. If we look at the width of this double windows from that left edge to the right side ledge is 30 millimeters in absolute terms measuring across the photo. If we go to this double window quite some way along, we can see that it's 12 millimeters. So it's dropped more than half the width. Now that's the effect of foreshortening as we've talked about. And in fact, if we go to this furthest double window, it's only eight millimeters wide. So it's, it's dropped by more than two thirds the width with the effect of foreshortening. Even though in life, these windows and those windows are the same. And that's why it's so important to allow for foreshortening in all the widths that we have horizontally, whether they're the windows or the spaces between the windows, everything is affected by foreshortening. However, the real thing we want to look at in this particular example is the effect of the changing angle of the wall on what we can see what we can see of the windows now if we look at this first window we can see that there are multiple panes within it and we can see in fact we're looking at almost almost two panes you know one and a half maybe a bit more than a fraction more than one and a half panes of glass here that we can see in this single window gap. If we move to the next, the next window, we can see only one pane of glass in fact. And if we move down to this third example of a single window, we can only see half a pane. And in fact, if we move to the furthest window, of this size, we can't see any panes of glass. In fact, we can only see half of the timber. And remember, that's what we were looking at in this diagram. We were seeing how, because the, the viewers stay still, what they can see changes as the building moves further away. And whereas with the closest windows, the viewer can see a certain amount of the, the glass, as the windows move further away, if the viewer doesn't move position, then they can see less and less of the glass until finally they won't see any of the glass. They're just going to see some of the edge of the window. And that's what's happening in this example. And so it's not just that there's foreshortening that changes where the window panes appear within the windows. It's not just foreshortening, the actual view of the window changes. And so whereas up here, we're seeing quite a bit of the window and whatever detailing is in the window. If it's just a pane of glass, it doesn't matter. But where there are struts supporting smaller panes of glass or perhaps ornate stonework, if it's a, if it's a gothic, fancy gothic window or the like, then, then it makes a big difference because in fact, we don't see any of that when we go, when we go further down. It doesn't affect these edges. These edges are only affected by normal foreshortening uh, by and large, because they're on a different plane. If you look, we can see that the actual window width is on this plane, but these edges of the thicknesses of the windows are on a perpendicular plane. And because of that, we continue to see a lot more of them than we do of the actual window surfaces. So when we, when we look at windows that we have to draw in rows, it's important to look up and look along and not just be looking for foreshortening, but also to be looking for where does the actual view of the window itself change significantly and, and where do we not see any of the window. It will help us appreciate foreshortening as well. But it's not, as I said, it's not, it's not that the foreshortening changes proportions, but what we see in the foreshortened width changes. So here, the percentage of width that's taken up by the edge of the window is, is maybe, I don't know, 40%, but here it's 90%.
So being aware of these changes of what we can see, the further away perspective takes something we're drawing, the more accurately we can draw it. And of course, just we can also see our first point here in, in looking up that, that from this view, we can just see, because our eye level is somewhere here, we can just see a little bit of the bottom windowsill and we can also see some of the top windowsill. And when we look further up in the next row, we can see that we don't see any of the bottom windowsill and we see more of the top windowsill. This is a wider, a wider space to draw than down here because our, again, our angle has changed, but this time it's in the vertical. Okay, so where does that leave us with our notional building? Well, again, we can see that we are able to yes, see these, these ledges from on the ground floor, but we see that this view disappears completely as we look up, but this view, this angle becomes more prominent. We can see more of it as the building gets higher. And in fact, if it was a very tall building, in the end, we'd, it would be the same way it goes horizontally. Instead of just seeing the, basically the edges down here, we'd be just seeing the tops further up. But another thing I find helpful in trying to imagine where to position things in this space is to just have a sense of the interior of the interior of the window box space and to realize that in fact There's a part of this that we can't see that the window is spread over. It's a little bit wobbly here, but you can see what I mean. And so when we go to place what may be a centered window pane divide here, we've got to realize that it's centered between here and here, not between here and here. And so when we go to place it further down, we don't just position it to allow for foreshortening, but in fact, we have to position it to allow for the fact that from the angle, there's more and more of the window that's being hidden by this section. This section actually widens proportionately. And so it's not just that, that the foreshortening affects it, but the actual positioning. And so here, I better do this one. And in this one, possibly we don't see it at all. And so this is allowing for all the mechanics of perspective, if you like, in looking at rows of windows that are stacked on each other and recede away from us. It's not just simple uh, compression as we get with that normal fore foreshortening, but it's also the angle that we see the actual window surface changes and that affects what we see. Look, it, it might sound complicated, but it's really worth getting some actual examples and looking at them and, and studying them and getting a feel for it. And because it really is a pattern. And once you start to see the pattern, it's easier to see it in life when we're drawing. I look for these things straight away now because I know they're there and it makes it much easier to find it and much easier to draw it. So don't think, oh, that's too hard. I won't worry about it. It becomes easier and easier every time you try and use it. Hi, I'm Stephen Travers. I hope this was helpful. I find that this, if you like, more theoretical side of perspective can be very helpful to study because when I'm actually in the field looking at something or even looking at a photo, if, if I know what to expect, it helps me to see it. And then when I do see it, it helps me to see it more accurately, which helps me to draw it more accurately. And in many scenes, this is hardly relevant. It's not strong enough to show, but sometimes it's a really crucial part of the overall visual impact of what we're seeing. When we have long rows of windows that all narrow and foreshorten, and that's part of the interesting pattern that we have. In that case, it is important to be able to represent it in some measure with accuracy. Anyway, keep practicing. Everything gets easier as we practice. Have fun. I'll see you next time. Bye.